Hi, today we're talking about ally work. So by definition, an ally is somebody who benefits from an oppression but works to crush it, to dismantle it. So it would be, for example, men against sexism or white people against racism. It's somebody who benefits from the oppression, so who's somebody's at the top position and is still actively working to end the oppression that they benefit from. Um, there's a few things to consider here. Is One is that by definition, since you are in the position of power, you have agent ignorance. That means that you don't really understand the phenomenon that you're trying to end. Not really in a deep sense. So you have to do all of your learning from book learning or from people telling you instead of your own internalized experience. That makes it to be really tricky work. Um, we've been taught that um, the bad people, we can say let's call it the racists or the sexists, are the people who intentionally are trying to say hurtful things, who tell the mean jokes, who do the mean things. And so anybody who's not actively intentionally doing mean hurtful things like sexist comments or racist comments isn't one of the problems. And so if you're not doing those mean things by intention, then by default, you're one of the good guys. And you can just kind of check out and not worry about it. This is the way we've been taught to think about oppression. The thing of it is, is that yes, there are the active folks who are actively trying to hurt folks, but there's very few of those, or fewer than we'd like to think. The bigger problem is the folks in the middle who don't intend to be hurtful, but end up benefiting from the system in any case, and may do some very hurtful, unintentional things. And that's what we're trying to train against. Those folks at the end, we're not really going to worry about them as much. We're going to focus on the folks kind of in the middle who unintentionally are benefiting and hurting folks. Um, when we think about the non or anti video, they're asking us to consider the fact that when you play neutral, you're act actually siding with the powerful folks. You're actually siding with oppression by checking out, by thinking this isn't something I really need to deal with. Somebody else should deal with this. The walkway example that Tatum is talking about is um, using the analogy of the moving walkway at the airport in which you can kind of just glide along without paying much attention. And as long as you just kind of stand still, it'll carry you in the same direction. And Tatum is saying that sexism or racism or all the oppressions are kind of a moving, flowing walkway in which everything is going in one direction. Everybody's attitudes, the jokes, the movies, the TVs, the laws, the institution are all flowing this way. So if you don't pay attention, you're going to get carried away. So these unintentional folks get carried along in the path. The thing of it is, we tend to think of the racist, sexist, homophobic folks as the folks who are kind of walking on the walkway. They go really, really, really fast. But we could even kind of turn our back and say, I disagree with sexism. I won't participate in it. And turn our back and then still get carried along the walkway. Because we're not actively fighting it, we just kind of get carried along. Instead of saying, well, the only way you can actually counter this is by actively walking in the other direction so that you can counter the movement that's carrying you this way. There's a very famous poem by a pastor named Martin Niemöller. Let me look it up so I can actually read it directly. He's talking about um, the phenomenon that he saw in um, the Holocaust. And it says, First they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. What he's doing is saying that we need to have solidarity. We need to care about somebody else's problem, not just our own. Or else, when it comes to be our turn, there's nobody going to be left to defend us. So he's making a plea for a self-interest focus and saying, you help somebody else and then in turn they will help you. So don't be so selfish that you can't help somebody else or else nobody's going to help you out. And this is kind of the basis of ally work is saying we need to be in this together so that we can all help dismantle systems of oppression, not just when it's our turn to care. It has to be that we care about somebody else's pain. Since we're doing work in which we don't actively understand the phenomenon in our own bodies, we just have to kind of learn it from our heads, we're going to likely make a lot of mistakes. In fact, we know that we're going to make mistakes. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So one of the really good activist skills is prepping and being ready for mistakes and saying, 
I know I'm going to make mistakes. What will I do when that happens? That helps us kind of get past the initial shock of saying, somebody's let me know that I've done something wrong. It's a really typical defensive thing to say, well, I didn't intend to say that. I don't, I don't say it like that when I say that word, or it was just a joke. You shouldn't take it like that. I'm not one of those racist people. It's just a joke or it's just a comment or it's just a word. And this is the confusion between intent and impact. You may intend something, but the impact is very different. So for example, you may not intend to step on somebody's foot, but the impact is that you just hurt somebody. And the first thing to do is get off of their foot. Stop doing what you're doing. And the second thing that you need to do is to apologize. You don't get to just stand there and say, well, I didn't intend to step on your foot. So you shouldn't be angry and you shouldn't demand an apology. So saying, oh, wow, I didn't mean to do that. I'm really sorry that I hurt you and start fixing it at that point. So we're going to train a few steps on how to show up when you've been told that you've made a mistake. First is to recognize that it's really typical to feel shame, right? We've been told that only those mean, hurtful, awful people do those bad things. So you may feel like you are a horrible human being and say, oh my God, I did this thing. I'm horrible. I'm shameful. I'm awful. And you want to kind of switch off of that and say, it's not something I am. It's just something I did. And so since I did something wrong, you can take the time to actually study that mistake and review it and say, what went wrong here? What did I do wrong? How can I avoid doing that in the next case? So a few good things to keep, keep in mind, a nice, easy formula is the first thing is to acknowledge that you just hurt somebody. You want to name it and say, you know, that was a really sexist thing that I just did there. It's like, that was really actually a big part of transphobia that I repeated for you and acknowledge that this was really painful and validate somebody and say, I'm really sorry. I know that when I misuse your pronouns that that can feel really invalidating, like you don't exist or like your gender identity doesn't matter to me. And I'm really sorry about that. So right there, we've got the naming and the apology, like the actual words, I'm sorry. You'd be surprised at how often those get skipped. You actually want to repair and make amends. So you just possibly ruin somebody's day or somebody's next hour. Try to do something nice for them. Offer something. It could be um, an errand. It could be a treat. It could be whatever it is that that person might need to feel a little bit better. You could even ask, is there something I could do to make you feel better right now? And the fourth step is really important is how is this person going to trust you to not do this again? How do I know that you actually learn from this mistake and know that you won't actually repeat it in the next hour or the next day? And this is where it comes really into play that you want to focus on educating yourself and say, I promise that in order to not do this, I'm going to read five articles on misgendering and pronouns. And that way I'm hoping that I'll learn a little bit more about this phenomenon and that I won't repeat it. Or I promise that whenever we go to an event that I will check in with you and let you know that I'm going to be watching my pronouns so that I don't keep repeating this mistake that you've been seeing from me. This is a way for folks who are on the oppressed side to be able to trust you a little bit more as an ally. We know you're going to make mistakes, so it's important that you get ready to receive that comment and move along. We have the example of the notion that prejudice is like tonsils or like teeth, right? You either have it removed and it's gone, and this comes from Jay Smooth and his TED Talk, or it's something that you need to keep going at. You need to keep practicing, just like brushing your teeth. It's a practice that needs upkeep. And just like being told that you got spinach in your teeth, it can be really embarrassing. It's the same where somebody's letting you know, hey, you made a mistake and say, oh, let me fix that right now. Because otherwise I'm going to walk around with that thing in my teeth and it's going to be really embarrassing. So it's better to know than to not know. Also recognize that when folks let you know that you've made a mistake, it's a sign of trust. It's a sign that they're willing to invest their energy into educating you because they actually expect that you learn from this. It takes a lot of energy to educate folks. And when you receive it badly, what that means is that somebody's not going to let you know next time when you've got spinach in your teeth and you're going to walk around looking like a fool. Okay. Thinking about all of this stuff, there's some pretty typical um, stages when it comes to ally work in knowing all that you don't know. And those are some of the things that you worked with this week is recognizing that there's more defensive stages. There's the guilt stage. There's the um, over glorifying stage. 
there's the move into organized collective action for dismantling. And depending on where you are on these stages, you'll be more or less ready to receive comments. It's really important to recognize that your work in activism and social justice is something that's going to keep improving over time. You weren't perfect then, you aren't perfect now, and you won't be perfect in the future. But hopefully you've been getting better. If you've been getting better, you can look back at a few years ago and say, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. That's really embarrassing. This happens to me all the time, just last week and the month before. I keep making really big mistakes and it's really embarrassing when it happens. And I can say, this is where I learn and I grow. If I didn't make mistakes and if I didn't take risks, that would mean that I was happy and comfy in my little comfort zone. And I'd probably be sitting in that neutral space of not doing very much at all. When it comes to showing up, we know you're taking a risk and we know you're going to make a mistake. Therefore, you're going to be ready and eager to be told that you've made a mistake. In thinking about um, trying to put some of these things into action, we have the scenario of thinking about the aunt and the 15-year-old nephew. Thinking about some of the things that we might recommend, one of the first ones is to get educated and recognize that you may not know this phenomenon and getting some really good sense of where you might find some good information, such as doing some Googling, family resources for uh, queer kids. And you might come across something like PFLAG, which is Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. And they have a ton of wonderful resources. So if you know how to do a good search, you might be able to point somebody in the right direction. Instead of just saying, go educate yourself, try to find some resources. You have some good knowledge at this point that you could share with somebody else. So we're coming to the close of the term. You should be able to give somebody some ideas. The scenario that I've presented you with actually comes from one of your classmates who came to me and said, what do I do about my gay nephew? I'm really worried about him. So we can use this as a training exercise and figure out some ways that you could show up. Something that's really important is trying to think of the folks that are in the situation with you. So see if you can find other allies to support you, such as your other siblings, or your sister-in-law, or your nephew's peers, such as classmates or cousins, and see if you can recruit them to help you out. Another thing that allies really need to get ready for is knowing that they are not as tired as the targets. They have a lot more stamina and energy left because then they haven't been taking the hits every day. So as an ally, it might be important for you to step in and take a blow and cover up for somebody so that they don't take the hit and you can take the burden. So for example, um, your job isn't to out your nephew or even to ask him if he's gay. But if he were to be gay, can you imagine some things that you might do to make life just a little bit easier for him if he decides to come out in a few years? Could you start having those conversations with your family members to get the ground ready for when he comes out? These are all little things to think about as you're working in ally work. But the most important thing to realize is, first of all, that you don't know and you can't know. So your education work has to be consistent and constant. And also, you know you're going to make a mistake. Getting really, really ready to the point where you're actually eager to be told and grateful when somebody takes the time to educate you is really important. Thanks for great work this week.